everybody, and welcome to Paranormal Nation Radio, Not So Normal. How's Denise and Ron doing tonight? Doing good. How you doing, Carl? Oh, getting rested up from that weekend that we just had. <laughs> it was a great weekend. Oh, that was... It went really fast for, well, staying up all night and Hi, all Jeremy. <laughs> Nigel. And basically, you know, we investigated on i was running on adrenaline so like about halfway to tennessee then my eyes were just burning it's like ah gotta stay awake so yeah we investigated on the 20s or on the 19th at mcpike then we got a call and you know we got to go investigate again on the 25th and went in on the 26th as well at mcpike and then drove from there to Ashmore, investi <coughs> investigated there the 26th and into the 27th. So we pretty much had a whole week of paranormal investigations. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and, and thank you, Nigel, so much. And hey, Jeremy. Hey, Nigel. Um, hey, Jeremy. But yeah, we've got some things we want to talk about. I mean, if you guys recall, a few weeks ago, we had Sharon Day on the show. And she gave us an idea for an for an experiment that we were going to try. And we thought, hey, this is the perfect time. We tried it. So we are going to bring on Sharon Hello, so we can Mom. talk about that. Hi, welcome Hello, back Sharon. to the show, Sharon. Hey, thanks for having me back. So we're, we're going to tell you what we did. Okay. I'm going to, well, I'm right. going to remind everybody what you said to do. And I'm going to tell you what we did. So you suggested that we all think the question and see if the spirits will answer the question or if we think of a word keep that word in our head don't say it out loud and you know all of us think it at the same time basically a group think tank kind of thing and we did that so the first place we tried it was at mcpike mansion we had had we had all of our friends there that were camping out there was and eight well, yeah. no, this is at McPike. Oh, at McPike. Okay. I yeah, we did it know. there first. Hey, Susan and Mike. So we've got all these people. We had <laughs> about 20 of us in the basement. Hey, Tom. And Tom McNicholas was there. Yep. And Dara and Caitlin, Lisa. So all these people that were camping were there. Yeah, I don't think we're really focused on that one. But, you know, we are going through all these questions. And, and uh, Sharon asked a question. And she wasn't getting anything. So I said, why don't everybody think about the person who asked the question and just think of her name. Don't say it out loud. Just think it. And let's see if the box can, the box or an EVP or something will come up and say her name. So we did that for a good five minutes, mm -hmm. you know, just everybody being quiet because in the basement of McPike, keeping people quiet doesn't work very well. But we had a couple of spirit boxes going, and they nothing said her name that we know of. So fast forward to the next week, we go to Ashmore Estates, and I write down four questions. First one is, is was uh, who scratched Denise was the first one. The second one was to think of somebody's name. And it was, I said, David, just think David's name. The third one is, where are we? And that answer could have been, you know, three or four different answers. It could have been, you know, the Coles County Poor Farm. It could have been the Alms House. It could have been Ashmore State. So it depended upon when the spirit came there, what is the answer? And then the last one is, what year is it? which, you know, that could be any multitude of years out there. And we did this on three different floors. And uh, we were all spread out on each floor, but we did it twice on each floor, once with just the recorders and once with the recorders and the spirit boxes. And we did that on each floor. And, you know, I basically had us all basically think the question or the answer eight times, you know, just keep thinking it. And so we had all eight of us. Do. 
I don't know if we got anything or not. Um, but once we go through all the data, we'll let you know what we got. Good. But it was a at least exercise and very we, we did it very metered, right? So we could redo it again if we had to in the same place the next time we go. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the spirit realm, what you're talking about is like collective consciousness. Uh, it's sort of a highway. And people that have near-death experiences, when they go to the other side, they describe a love that's like stronger than anything you can imagine. But then you're also talking about the whole spirit realm collectively having the same consciousness. And, and we're tapped into it spiritually with our souls. But here on Earth, we're distracted by all the mortal nonsense. And so when we get in a group together, whether it's to fight a war or to praise in church, we are uh, tapping into a collective consciousness. And that's the, uh, the highway of communication. Have, have you done this experiment that we've done? Mm -hmm. I've only done it one time. I did it in Tombstone at the Birdcage Theater and uh, only got some vague answers from that. But the Tombstone uh, Birdcage is, is totally, literally haunted as it is. It's a very hard one to work with. It's a wood structure on a very noisy street not far from uh, mm -hmm. Big Nose Kate Saloon where all the partying and the bands and everything are going on. So I usually tell people, if you're going to do it, it's a tri-level and all three levels have openings that interact with each other. So I only send two people in the building at a time because if there's anybody on the other levels, they interfere vocally. Um, and, and then you have to try to do it on a Sunday night if you can, when it's possibly the quietest night there. So I'd like to give that a try at a different location. Yeah, I think I'd like to try it again at different yeah. times mm -hmm. in the same location. And maybe like you said, leave the recorder and walk out of the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we always keep recorders. And like if we're in a building, we have recorders in every room. We have usually two in each room because uh, you can be in the living room asking questions and the answer comes from a far off bedroom. Um, and on only one recorder in that room, not both of them. So yeah. if, uh, we're still trying to figure out how to pinpoint you know, that magic sweet spot where, where they work or they don't work. Uh, we've put them in Faraday uh, bags so that they can't get any signal. So you can say this literally was not in receiver mode because you can get some, you know, extra things that are picked up by anything that's a, a you know, a, a receiver. I used to get that on my, remember when we used to have answering machines? <laughs> Somebody could drive down the street on the phone and all of a sudden the, the machine's got a voice on it, you know. It's built to be a receiver. So um, the only way to really, you know, block that off is put it in a Faraday bag. Yeah. Radar, I mean, radio waves can travel long distances too. You just don't know. I mean, it is possible that that radio wave never stops, keeps going and going and going mm -hmm. until it hits something. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's analog and there's there's digital. And analog, if you're talking about a tape recorder, um, they're fantastic for picking up things. The only thing that we run into with that situation is uh, the mechanisms that run it. Make right. Them. So uh, it has its ups, it has its downs. Yeah, that's what I use. So, yeah, we tried that. So we had, we had that. I used my uh, cassette recorder. Mm -hmm. um, other people use digital recorders. And uh, so we've, we've had a lot of success with reel to reel, but you have to be patient to use something like that. And I think mm -hmm. most of us just can't wait to get home and check the evidence. And now you're talking about having to digitize it. So, yeah, luckily my recorder has a way to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was, it was, it's great. I can just plug it in and I can put it in my computer and I can listen to it and mm -hmm. save it and send it and whatever. But it's, it's going to, I mean, we know that it's going to take, I mean, figure these three experiments that we did, each person who got something or got that did recording, it's only going to be like five minutes each recording. So it won't take long to go through the six mm -hmm. record or yeah, six recordings yeah. at five minutes a piece. You're looking at a half an hour. And as you're going through it, you're going to go back and forth some. Mm -hmm. So she yeah, now, I, ultimately, the idea for that, I mean, not only because, of course, spirits don't have 
ears. Um, they communicate what we would call, I guess, mind speak. But uh, it, it just seems like you could get more specific answers if everyone is concentrating on the one thing. Because, I mean, I've had ones where I remember one time we did a, a really good investigation, very active place, and uh, we got a lot of vocal. Um, but the, when we got a real answer that was clear to everyone, you know, just totally class A, uh, that came from somebody in the group who was thinking about their dead aunt. And they got the aunt's name and I think the year of her birth or something. And, and we sat around puzzling. Well, that, that was an answer that didn't fit our question. But this one person was having stray thoughts. And maybe because of the emotional content of that, that one got answered. So we really had to pick everyone's minds. Okay, what were you really thinking about? <laughs> you know, what are they answering here? Yeah, it's kind of like one of the things that I always tell people is when you go to a haunted location, you've already set the expectation out there that you're going to speak to a spirit. It's not saying that you're going to speak to the spirits at that location. You may bring the spirit with you that's going, finally, they're going to hear me. Mm -hmm. And they speak up like the ant may have just spoke up and said, you know, here I am. Talk to me now. And, um, you know, we, you know, they, that's why I tell people they laugh that I actually go to cemeteries. They're like, that's dead bodies. Why are you going to a cemetery? But if you go to a cemetery and you go where there's like new balloons, new flowers, people have just visited there, you get amazing results because you go all year missing somebody you think about them now and then but when you sit down at their grave you catch them up on your life you're calling them there and and, and it, people you know neglect that connection and it and it, it does exist they come you want to hear something weird hmm. when we're late on our way out everybody said there's a, a cemetery that we need to visit supposedly there's a witch out there all it is is just they just put february 31st as the day that they died it's it's not Mm -hmm. But anyway, we're out there. We're looking at all the different ones. This is a small graveyard out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, Denise is kind of drawing the one. I said, well, yeah. She, I said, which one? She said, that one over in the corner. I said, yeah, that's that's got an interesting, uh, you know, stone on it. It's you know, a real fancy one. About that time, it was, it was us, Susan and Mike were out there with us. And... Next thing you know, a truck pulls up. The people get out. There's a man and a woman, and they go over right to that grave that we were drawn to. <laughs> they clean up a little bit and everything. We had to wait, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes or so. Patiently. Before, yeah, we didn't want to, you know, just barge in. But anyway, they're paying respects to that person. When we finally got over, when they finally left and we got over there, that person had passed away as a 15 year old kid that got it was killed in a hunting accident from he died in 2006. They they were still visiting this kid. Oh, yeah. It wasn't I looked at, you know, the day he was born, the day he died. It wasn't they weren't out there on any of those days. They just they just came out and visited. Aww. Same time we were there. Yeah, that's that's such a young death. I can see visiting the grave. Yeah. If you go to a cemetery where the graves are so old that there's no one living that even knew them, I usually go up to the grave and I'll say their name out loud. It just hasn't been said in a long time. Well, right. I tried to start a fight. <laughs> uh, well, bless you. So there, there was a stone there, and it had it was an X shape, and mm -hmm. it had in the middle it had Milton Barnes. And it had Martha Barnes and Mary Barnes. And and I was like, hmm, hey, Mary, do you know that he married Martha? And that there she's just buried on the other side of him. <laughs> Martha, do you know that that he was married to Mary and that you're you got you guys are having to share here? <laughs> Oh, I, I, out, out west, you know, when I go to cemeteries, because I'm obsessed with, oh, I'm an artist. I love to sketch and photograph. But I go there, and it's amazing to me to see how many graves have the man there, because they usually die first. And then they have their wife's name next to them and her birth year, but they never have the her her death year. But that was like 100 years ago. So she must right. have moved on. I <laughs> so noticed that, too. You're alone. 
or they just didn't chisel it in or yeah nobody contacted them no. and said contacted wow. the stone cutter to say hey right. can you go fix this um mm -hmm. yeah. i did find out though that one thing you can do you can contact the person who's taking care of the graves you know the, the graveyard or the cemetery and they will contact the stone cutters if you actually have factual date to put in it oh, and right. they'll get it done yeah, you know, I like to go and find a grave because it's a it's kind of a cool site, but you come across some obscure, maybe hidden or unknown cemetery, you can actually, you know, inventory it for them. And it's helped me to find obscure relatives that like died, you know, hillbilly members of the family that died in some cemetery in the middle of the woods now where it used to be a clearing, you know, but somebody mm -hmm. documented it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we had we had a visitor. <laughs> <laughs> little four-legged yeah. one. Aww. But, yeah, I mean, we used that as well. We looked up the, the boy on Find a Grave and found out that he had died in a hunting accident. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that's sad. But what drew me to his stone wasn't his stone. It was the fact that they had a blanket out there and some other stuff. It looked like somebody had been going out there and sitting on the blanket oh, yeah. and talking to him. Mm -hmm. And we assume that the person who came out wasn't his parents. We assume it was his brother. And, uh, but it was it, as sad as it was, it was good to see that they were there. They were pulling weeds and all this other stuff, making sure it looked nice, you know, and you can't ask for better than that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was in Sedona one time and I was going to, they have a beautiful cemetery there and I was going through and I noticed a bottle of champagne, glasses with champagne and a piece of cake. And you know, I went to this grave and it was the person's birthday. And so yeah. the family had come to visit that very day. So I sat down with the recorder. I just got so much like light singing and this gr very girly voice. I couldn't discern any of it, but um, obviously the family came and had champagne because she would have turned 21 that day. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Hey, Judy. So, but yeah, it was, it was kind of a very neat cemetery. So if you ever go out to Ashmore Estates, mm -hmm. go to St. Omer's and thank you, Tom, for sending us the information. We really appreciate it. And Carl really liked going to the, to the bridge. So, so it yeah, was, it was a good way to awesome. keep him busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, those are some cool, cool places you got to go to. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Yeah. Hey, Charlie. So, um, so we were going to talk to you this time mm -hmm. about aliens and cryptozoology. I think somebody was dyslexic when they chiseled 3 1. <laughs> I think they, honestly, yeah. so the witch died, they say February 31st. I think she died. At the last, they said the last day of the month, and, and the guy or was just the 13th, oh. and the guy just put the numbers backwards. Yeah, because he didn't want to put 13 on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's even worse because that could it's be that too. What's bad is it Super started sick. a rumor that this was a witch. Mm -hmm. They have zero proof, and what they do have is it's a woodcutter's grave. It's a very right. expensive. Yeah stone or monument yeah and if it was very a witch, expensive they back wouldn't. in the day yeah it's they, round it's an or a giant ball yeah on a like yeah wood, well if you go to saint cutters. omar's grave site that picture is right on the first one it's a round spear and that spear is probably every bit uh two foot across wow mm -hmm. yeah setting on what looks like logs stacked it's amazing Very what somebody expensive. did back in those days to chisel all that out. Mm -hmm. I love urban legends. <laughs> <laughs> so Susan sent me some information. Okay. So it says uh, several non-standard dates are used in calendars for various purposes. Some are expressly fictional. Some are intended to produce a rhetorical effect such as sarcasm which we know my, Liz, my Liz person know. the yeah. other and others attempt to address a particular mathematical mathematical 
scientific or accounting requirement or discrepancy within the calendar system. And so there is another one that has February 31st, 1869 as, as an example. So artificial calendars also have 30 days in February. For example, in the climate model, the statistics may be simplified by having 12 months of 30 days. So that's one of them. But February 31st or 31 February is exceptionally used on gravestones when the date is unknown or in at least one case out of supposed superstition, but most likely an error. Right. So then there's yes, one more thing. Here's one more. Damn it. Sorry. May 35th is hey, used Gary. in mainland China to avoid censors, censorship when referring to the Tiananmen Square protests in 1989, where the official names are strictly censored by the national government. And the Here event is normally referred to as June 4th and is also used in the title of the 35th of May. So thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. So, but like I said, I, yeah, you know, when we looked at that stone, you can tell that back then it probably cost in the 1800s, probably cost a thousand dollars. Oh yeah. So you, that was it. And they would, if yeah. it had been a real witch, they would have not marked her grave at all. No, they, they wouldn't have let her into a hallowed ground. Yeah. Nope. And it had her husband's name, her child's name, and her name all on there. So, mm -hmm. but like I said, it was, uh, it looked like a giant stone with uh, logs. And when I saw the logs, the first thing I thought of was it, that the husband was a woodcutter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then so, it, set, it didn't set on the dirt. It set on a concrete slab mm -hmm. that it was covered with dirt and from over the years, you know. But yeah, it was covered up. The ground was covered up. Hmm. Yeah, we used to help out on tours on the graveyards and that. And I, Liz Lane was the, the woman that did it. She, she knew, she did a lot of homework on the history of all these different, the statues. I mean, everything. I had no idea. It was that involved. Yeah, there's all the iconology that's on yeah. all the stones, what yeah. this means, what that means. Yeah, we learned you know, a lot. Why why somebody would go with an obelisk? Why would somebody go with, you know, around a stone? Why are the stones for the Confederate soldiers pointed and the ones for the Union soldiers yeah. round? Well, they're pointed because they didn't want them to sit on them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard to sit with a Something going What's up your butt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but now you have a bird poo perch where they can poo on you, so you can't win. Yeah. But you know, they didn't know that back then. <laughs> they didn't even think about no. that. So, but yeah, there's all kinds of different things that when you re research it, there and the thing, there's not a good website to go to to find all this information that she had given me mm -hmm. way back when. Yeah. yeah. So you know, what does this mean? Well, you know, some of it you can tell, you know, doves, you know, we all know what that, you know, that's heaven. Lamb, lamb of God, it's probably a child. You the know. tilted cross, yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's my favorite history has to be going to a graveyard and then looking up that person that I'm drawn to on find a grave to see if there's any stories. And if there's not, then, you know, newspapers.com, finding an old obituary, it tells you so much about their life and and makes you respect those people even more. Well, and it's important to do your homework. You're doing the right thing. We have a cemetery here in Phoenix that uh, I kept getting activity uh, photographically, like insane stuff, rainbows and and flashes of color and, and just all kinds of weird stuff. And I would bring other people with different cameras, different years, different months, and the same thing. They were getting, you know, these these weird things. And no, even my, at the time, the man I was married to, he didn't believe in anything at all. 
And he went just to kind of guard me while I was at this cemetery. And I said, here, take the camera and see what you get. And so I decided to look, it was a grave that was encompassed by a fence, but there were like 19 family members in there. And so I went and looked up the patriarch, found out that he was the guy who laid the modern day water canals in, in Phoenix area. What I found out later was that that cemetery was on top of the ancient water canals that the missing tribe had put in long, long ago. So there was just this weird association there. And uh, it still to this day has the strangest, like anyone can photograph there and they're gonna get something weird. Well, we'll have well, next time we go out that way, hey, hopefully we can get down to Phoenix and mm -hmm. check stuff out. So speaking of Phoenix, mm -hmm. there was a an event that happened there that, <laughs> you know, the Phoenix lights. Yeah. What do you think about that? Um, I lived at the base of the mountain. So literally I went out the night before to see Hale Bob. I did not go out the night that the uh, Phoenix lights occurred. Um, but I, the last five years, I've owned a house at the base of the mountain, and uh, the mountain itself has very odd lights on it, doing strange things. It's the uh, largest municipal park in America, but there's no roadways or you know no activity there. So um, these lights, I would go out almost every night and be photographing them, doing splitting apart, becoming colors, doing all these things, and. Um, the land that I was living on was the ancient burial place of that missing tribe. And uh, I had even dug up some of the ashes and stuff from when they had buried their people here. So uh, lots of things associated with that mountain. It's, it's all kinds of weird. Uh, but, the, but the Phoenix Lights about, that happened in March of 97 and November 1st of 97, I was heading to a party behind the mountain and uh, my friend and I were riding along and literally the same formation came right over ahead of us. Uh, it was below the mountains. So it was, you know, less than a, a thousand feet down. Um, but it was a huge triangle of these lights silently just gliding right over. Um, it was back before people had cell phones and, you know, digital cameras and stuff. So all we could do is pull over and just watch it and go, oh my God, that's the Phoenix lights. So there was either, you know, and now and then people still see that formation here and there. I'm not sure why Phoenix is the one. Um, maybe it's just a place that these, these things have been coming for thousands of years. And it's, you know, like you drive past your old neighborhood, you know, 30 years later. I, I have no idea. Yeah, because I know that one of the first people to turn that in, you know, to call and say, hey, I saw this was Kurt Russell. Yeah, he was flying at the time. Thousands of yeah. people. Yeah, he was flying his plane at the time and he called it in. And yeah. first off, why would you I mean well one of, one, of the, one, of the MUFON, one of the MUFON investigators at that time has uh, he's sitting on a lot of evidence that he waits for permission to share, but one of them was a helicopter, a police helicopter that was observing this and reporting it. And another one was a tiny private plane that came up from Tucson to Phoenix. And it came up over the hills, like over the curve of the hills there, and almost felt like they were going to hit this thing. And they had to maneuver to avoid it. Um, so there's a lot of people that just didn't want to be weird and announce that they've encountered it. You know, even our governor, you know, he pulled a person up on stage dressed as an alien and made right. fun of it when he himself, an ex-pilot, had witnessed it. So that's the power of, um, I'm glad we're in a time where if you see a UAP or you have an encounter, it's just added to the evidence instead of uh, laughed at and, and, you know, pushed away. Well, I mean, we are not the only life in the universe <laughs> or universes, but again, that would be very, that would be stupid mm -hmm. to think think that you know so i unrealistic completely yeah. unrealistic yes not stupid yeah well people pe you know people who are closed minded cannot wrap their heads around the fact that you know god created 
the universe, that doesn't mean that we were the only things he created. Yeah, usually I think if you're a creator, you don't just have a one shot. You, know, you keep working. You messed up it. somewhere. You know, and even as an artist, my pieces of art are completely different. They're different worlds. So why not? I mean, you kind of want to get a little something out of each one. And if you want the universal knowledge to be gained, uh, observing these mortal universes would would gain a lot. Of, I mean, all the what, seven or eight billion people on Earth, we're each having a completely different way of approaching mortal life. Imagine when we get back to the origin and bring back that recorded information, uh, it just becomes a more brilliant universe. Uh, it's, it's a humbling thought. But, but I do understand not reporting uh, UFO stuff. I've had alien encounters my whole life, and it was something that until recent years, I would not talk about at all. Um, it just was too exceptional, and people really weren't ready to hear it. And, and I, but I, I feel that there's a lot of people like me out there that have these things, and they're just really shy about, and they feel very alone. And so somebody has to say, hey, it happens. So other people can understand and be comforted by that. Well, we're ready to hear it. <laughs> yeah. So, That's why we got you back so soon. So the question, okay. So the um, question that I have mm -hmm. is if a spaceship was sitting outside your no home spaceship. right now, no, no would, would you get on it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Easily. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. So you. I'm in the latter part of life. Like, you know, you always regret what you didn't do, what you're too scared to do. I don't want to wonder what was there and where they would have taken me. Um, I only have limited years left. So what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> Oops, sorry. It's okay. My mom's not listening. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I can take you back to um, when I was about four or five. Um, I'd say yeah, just about to turn five. I was in my bedroom at night and I woke up and I was wide awake and I looked over at the side of my bedroom near the front, near the door. There was a little alien gray, the classic, what we would call a gray. Uh, the only thing different about him was he had a crystal in the middle of his forehead, like right where the third eye would be. Um, and as a child, my thought was, oh, he must be a king. Um, he was flanked by two tall whites. They have very similar kind of body, but I can tell you that where his head came up to and where how tall they were, they were at least seven feet tall. But I don't recall looking at their faces because I was having a mind connection with the gray. And um, I had a weird feeling like, um, like a wise parent or a mentor was talking to me. And now mind speak is not really words. I have to interpret it. It's knowledge. They put they put the knowledge in there. You open up the file and you paraphrase it the way you would say it in your language. So basically what he was telling me as he was staring at me was, um, I gave you some things that make you different. And uh, you have a purpose, you have a mission, but you're going to have many, many trials in your life. When you start using those things I gave you, it's time for your mission. And then the last thing that he reported was, I would never see him again. Mm. And uh, I, I sort of tucked that away as a kid. Now I look back at some of my behaviors right after that, I started feeling like I was being watched and, and listened to. So I would narrate things like, oh, today I feel so cruddy, you know, so-and-so in school bothered me. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I grow up, I want to do this. And like, I felt like I was constantly, it was like the Truman Show. I knew something was monitoring me. Now I look back now knowing what I know and the context of my childhood. Uh, my dad worked in, in DC. Um, the day that I was born, he left a top secret job that even my mom wasn't allowed to know. He carried a card that could get him on any flight without question. Um, he couldn't talk to my mom when he was on his missions. He couldn't explain what he does. But the day that I was my mom went into labor with me. He suddenly, magically that day, got called in to work for USPS, um, head, the head of um, HR, basically, for the, for the whole country. And it was a job that apparently 
like, where did this come from? <laughs> um, but he'd always worked for the government. So we didn't, you know, question that. But so my mom went and had me. Well, my mom had had um, stillborn twins before me and had cervical cancer. And they did extensive surgery on her. And they said, you can never have children. It's just impossible. But mom got pregnant with me. And I was a little different. The, the kids in our family were intelligent, but I was genius level. And I was very psychic. And I had other things like uh, facial amnesia, um, synesthesia for time and space, um, just some odd things that made me feel really weird and different. So I didn't really want to talk about them or use them. Um, I just wanted to be normal like everyone else. But then you jump forward. Um, when I was 17, I got the same cancer my mom had. Uh, she had taken a drug during pregnancy that gave both of us cervical cancer. So at 17, I went through extensive surgeries and treatments, and they said, you can't have kids. And I had my son, and his skills are, and intelligence are even higher than mine. So there's some different thing about me and my son and that lineage. Um, I went and had my Ancestry.com done and found out I have 25 chromosomes, uh, should have 23. So what's going on there? You know, I need to I need to get in with a geneticist and talk about that because it's not a replication. You know, I'm yeah. not I'm not uh, you know the 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 Down syndrome <laughs> marker. So what what is this? The 24th chromosome has no proteins, no LLs. Um, 25th is a complete and total, has all its LLs, but they're not copies of anything. So what are they? What do they do? So are, are you RH negative? No, uh, my son is, I'm, I'm positive. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. And, and I still don't understand because my mom was O negative and dad was A positive and they had uh, five children. The, the, the twins were still born and that was part of the incompatibility. They didn't have Rogam back then. So you, if you were incompatible, your body fought off and your child died. Yeah. Um, so how did she do this? How is that even possible? Uh, I have a million questions on that. But well, I Maybe those, it's because uh, your siblings are the same as your mom to where her body didn't, you know. Because uh, no, uh, I mean, we, yeah. we, yeah, I mean, we have um, three of the siblings are O like mom, but they're positive. Right. And uh, two of us are A and positive. So none of us are negative. Um, but oddly, now that I think about it, my three siblings who died young were all O. o and my brother, who's A, and me are both still here. So I don't know. I, I, that's, a, that's a puzzle for another day. <laughs> yeah. So basically, what ended up happening with me is I tried to be normal. Now, I was living in a very famous haunted house. It was a constant crazy show, you know, newscasts coming over, TV series about it, you know, newspaper articles, everyone, everyone knew the monster's house on the hill, you know, you couldn't get away from it, it was very, very haunted. It was, the, the entire grounds were haunted, um, but it was a pleasant haunting. I never felt threatened or any of that. I just felt a lot of compassion, I guess you'd say. Uh, a lot of people died in the, that field hospital. So uh, it was just a constant, sadness to it. Um, so, you know, here I am trying to be a normal kid in a weird situation with unusual skills that I'm afraid to use. The only time I used my psychic skills, and I didn't even know they were psychic, I thought everyone had them, is the ability to touch an object and read the other people who've touched it or had come in contact with it. It's a skill called psychometry, and I, mine is exceptional to the point of uh, exquisite detail. And I always thought other people, you know, I'd hand them an artifact I dug up on the grounds and they're, they're not getting this information. And I, that was, I, I didn't, I thought psychics just like read your palm and told you the future. I, I didn't know there was a psychometry. It was just my normal set point. And then having, having facial amnesias, another interesting, I've pondered why I have that problem. Now, Brad Pitt admits he has it too, which is comforting to see someone described the kinds of things. Like I could be in a store. I don't expect to run into my best friend. I could stare right at my best friend and not realize it's her. And, you know, go home and get a call, you know, like, what do you hate me? You were staring right at me. <laughs> now, if she had said she was going to be there, I would look for some of her characteristics. But um, I, if I close my eyes, I have no idea what I look like. 
I don't know what my son looks like. I don't know what anyone looks like. There's in my dreams. I never look up at the face because it's not going to help me. Um, I read energy. That's how I can tell who's who. So um, it's just a weird, a weird quirk. But so here I am trying to have a normal life, and I married young uh, someone who had no belief in anything, atheist. Uh, there is no supernatural. This is all hoodoo. Don't talk about it. Don't, people are going to think you're crazy. Don't say anything. And um, you know I went that pathway and uh, hit all that stuff. But like the alien had told me, basically, I was going to go through a lot of trials. And I did enormous amount of loss and struggles and trials and a bad marriage. But the minute I left the bad marriage, I started using my skills. And I thought, well, they've got to be gone by now, right? But I took them out and they worked just as good as if I had been using them all along. Uh, I, it, they didn't atrophy. So I started using them. I had my blog, Ghost Hunting Theories, and I shared you know, a lot of things on the different subjects. And uh, I just dove right into research and said, I'm not gonna pretend this isn't here. You know, it's, it's the elephant in the room. You know, there's this whole world we're not addressing. We need to address this. And so it became uh, a passion. But then uh, one night I woke up wide awake. I'd been divorced about a couple of years. Yeah. And, um, and, and my blog was taking off. I was doing lots of radio shows. I was doing tons of research, lots of uh, looking at ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot, you name it. Um, I wake up wide awake um, and I swing my legs over the bed to go use the restroom. And there's an alien right in front of me. He's, he's sleep. He's standing probably three, four feet away from my bed. And I remember my first instinct. I'm not scared at all. Um, I, I, I feel comfortable around them, but my first thought was don't stand up sharing your five foot eight and scare the crap out of him. <laughs> and then he'll go away. <laughs> I kind of wanted to know why he's there, but then I saw a movement out of the corner of my eye and I looked in at the corner of my bed, there was another one. And then I saw, something over here and so i looked in at the foot of the bed there was another one and there was yet one more on the other side of the bed so they were kind of encircling four of them encircling the bed now what i can tell you about aliens because you know i go back and i i really observe it when it usually when things are happening i don't get scared and run i don't panic i just i'm an archivist i stop and try to remember everything my first thought was yeah they look alike but they're they're different they're individual they're on the same mission so they almost, and I think this is what people get wrong about graves, that they're somehow little droids or robots. They're not. They're all collected by consciousness, which means they all move together with the same purpose, but they're all very individual. The one that I was just about to stand up in front of, um, I felt a special affection for that one. The one at the corner of the bed I could tell was basically a newbie, like he's learning the system. The one at the foot of the bed was the leader. There was no doubt about that. And as I looked at the leader, this red orange light, um, and I can only describe it as like a plasma light. It started in his solar plexus and it started to stretch. And then he was just gone. And it, he was right beside my dresser. The dresser did not light up. Nothing in the room lit up. It was just him that was the light. It was, it was very much like plasma. And I also say that because there was a scent of ozone and there was a sense of heat. So there was some kind of action occurring there. He had no technology on him. Um, it, I could literally feel him concentrating to disappear. And then the one beside me went and the one at the foot of the corner of the bed, he went at almost the same time. And I looked across the bed at the one on the other side and he, he looked like he was trying really hard. He, he was, I could feel the pressure of him trying to concentrate or, or log in or whatever he was doing. He turned away from me as if I wasn't going to notice him while he's trying to get this light to come. And I crawled across the bed because my thought was that that's not their skin, that that's some kind of a suit that they're wearing. And it almost looked like a really fine suede, like it would have a texture. And so I was reaching out for him to touch his arm. And I remember my mind thinking, dude, turning around doesn't make you go away. I can still see you. You know, like it was just like mm -hmm. the, I, I, he almost reminded me of a dumb cousin that I have. You know? <laughs> it was 
like bumbling. It was the Don Knotts of the aliens. Um, but he did, <laughs> he did get the light to come. He did disappear. But when I had woken up and I was wide awake and they were around the bed and I was sitting up, I got a, co a compiled message from them. The first thing I sensed from them was they were told to come at night because I cannot be paralyzed. And that's true. I can't. I can't be paralyzed. So they'd have to deal with me moving around. Now, they probably should have known that I wasn't going to fight them because I, I feel a connection with them. I like them. I think they're cool. I think they're on the right road. But um, they, they were thinking and concentrating, okay, she woke up. They knew I had some kind of a, a good sense, like, I, like my senses were more keen than most people. So uh, the message that they sort of popped into me was, um, you're using your skills and your mission's about to arrive. That's, that's the basis. And um, when they disappeared, I literally was out of the bed within a second and I was checking the carpet for footprints. I was, you know, looking out the window. I was going through the apartment. I was trying to find like some mothership or something. There was nothing there. It was just a still, clear, Phoenix, dark night. Um, but I could feel that what they did was sort of a concentrated effort. And I want to think that this consciousness thing is it's becoming more evident in UAP research that they may actually fly their vehicles by using their consciousness. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you for figuring this out. It's the answer to everything. Uh, it, it can make magic happen. So I, um, they, they left. And at the time I had a really crappy job. It was, <coughs> it had gone through a lot of changes in the industry. I was typing medical reports. And they got the keen idea to let the computers type the reports and I could be this really cheaply paid for editor. Well, the computer had no clue what the doctors were saying. Doctors were from Ukraine, China, you name it. They couldn't do it. So I had a mentor that was helping me learn how to uh, trade stocks. And uh, so I was working really hard, but I was also practicing my stock trading. I was making a little extra money, but I needed more if I wanted to leave my industry. So one night I went to bed and I said, hey, dudes, wherever you are, just give me a stock name. Just give me a stock name. I'll trade it. I'll make money and I can leave my job and do whatever the freak mission you want me to do. But the mission's not going to happen with me writing books, working a job and trading stocks. You got to make it easier. So I went to bed. I woke up in the morning and I had repeated in my mind, I N O I N O I N O I N O, and I thought, oh wait, those are letters. Okay, I N O. That's familiar. <clears throat> so I looked into my stocks that I had been trading, and a while back I'd been trading I N O. And I started looking into like where this, where the status is right now, and uh, you know what kind of leverage I would have, and so I started trading it like vigorously, vigorously, and uh, within uh, like maybe ten months. I had enough to quit my job. So I quit my job and uh, and moved away to another apartment several miles away. And uh, I went to bed one night, I woke up and I was wide awake and I thought, oh man, <laughs> is it mission time? And so I'm laying there looking at the ceiling and out of the corner of my eye, I can see an alien, but I know that energy. It's the guy from my childhood that said, I would never see him again. So I purposely did not turn to look at him, but I could see him, right? I mean, I could, he was close enough. I could see his whole outline. And um, so I just kept staring at the ceiling and I just, my mind was like, you know how they say your, your life flashes before you? It was that speed, it was crazy. There was all this info, it was like a big giant zip file. And, um, Basically, the, the, the parting message from him was, uh, you're ready. And he was gone. And I, I, even, I could see the light that he left in. It was right, you know, right there in the corner of my eye. And, uh, and I smelled that electrical ozone smell and the heat. And then the heat dissipates very quickly. Um, he gave me basically a zip file. And it was going to take me about 24 hours to unload it, to, to interpret all that I got. Uh, the first thing I got was the mission. And it sounded very vague. 
and it was in a wording that I never use. In fact, I went and had to look up one of the words because I wasn't sure I really understood what it meant. The mission was um, find the schism between the worlds, open and close the door at will in front of witnesses. And I'm like, what do you want me to open a portal or something? Look, I'm just this regular girl, you know, living in an apartment, trading stocks. Like, I, I don't have those skills. What, what, do, you, what do you want from me? Um, and I, I still to this day, every now and then I'll come across something that makes me go, okay, oh, this might be the, this might be the schism, you know. And usually what a schism is, is it's something that divides two different uh, thought processes, like uh, Democrats and Republicans or, you know, Catholics and Jews, you know. So um, I, I, I I have no idea how to open and close that. Is it literal? Is it figurative? But it was what came with that mission was basically a broad understanding of things about the universe that maybe we aren't aware of. Now, ironically, I was obsessed, uh, I guess, from digging up artifacts. I wanted to be an archaeologist. So I did a lot of archaeology studies in high school and college. And um, yeah, one of the things that... Um, that struck me about this is um, the, I was shown a world in where, when, when I was studying archaeology, I used to question a lot of things. And I always do that. I, I got kicked out of Sunday school a lot of times, you know, for explaining that men come from women, not women from men, <laughs> as men have milk ducks and nipples. But anyway, so, um, you know. <laughs> So there's your definition. Uh, of man yeah. versus woman. We all start out the same, but you know, we go this way or we go that way. Uh, apparently we need to re re educate people about that process. But, <laughs> um, so yeah, what he was showing me was something I had always questioned, you know, cave art and stuff where they always go, Oh, when archeologists don't understand something, it's religious because it just makes no sense. It's nonsensical. It must be their, their gods or their spirits, you know. But what I was shown was that uh, early in man's time here on the planet, at least the higher intelligent um, homo sapiens, when we first really started taking off, we were openly inter interacting with all these other parallel realms, beings from all kinds of places. And we thought that was normal. And, and ironically, that's how I felt growing up in a haunted house. I was a baby in it, and that is the way the earth is. That's the, these things aren't weird. These things are part of nat nature, you know? And uh, so I guess early man, it was, they didn't think anything of it. It wasn't magical to them. It was just, you know, we all share this world. And so it's a lot of these things that we see on cave walls and in drawings and things that we think must be gods were actually encounters with other realms and other beings. And it was perfectly natural. But at some point in this sort of uh, universal experiment, they uh, decided to shut that down. See, as mortals, how we would handle um, not having that other piece of information about the universe, where we think we're the universe, we're all there is. And um, I was told at the time that we would start, they would start introducing these things back to us. We're going to run into more ghosts. We're going to run into Bigfoot. We're going to run into Dogman. We're going to run into weird spaceships and aliens and all these things were going to happen more and more and more. And it was basically a testing ground. They wanted to test, will we accept it? How will we handle it? Um, but the stunning thing that I was shown was if man doesn't handle sharing the universe with others, uh, we would be cut off. And in being cut off, that also means our souls, that we would literally not go to heaven. And so it was kind of a terrifying thought to think that's a huge responsibility that we can comport ourselves and not throw rocks at the moon and, and just accept that these things are with us. And I'm really hoping that a lot of the things going on in quantum physics can help the public to kind of understand better and not be threatened by it. I, you know, they, they don't need our stuff. Our, what, what we value is completely different. Um, and I think we have a better, I think we would be less bigoted about anybody or anything if, if we knew what the variety of life was. So uh, it's kind of where, where it goes for me. Yeah. Good night, Nigel. <laughs> and welcome, Crystal and Mark, to the show. If anybody has any questions for Sharon, please make sure you put them in the chat and we will get them asked. 
And we do have a question for you before we get much further into this. Right. Tom McNicholas asks, do you think that looking at people directly into their eyes, you're exposed to part of their souls? Yeah. yeah. I mean, touching somebody or looking into their eyes. I, I think we, we don't give the eyes enough credit and the pineal gland might be the, the thing that we're missing here. Now our pineal gland, what we call the third eye in the brain, it's, it's connected to our eyes. So if there's like lack of light, we start releasing melatonin for the dream state. And, uh, and that's kind of where all the magic begins. Uh, it's also very sensitive because it floats in cerebrospinal fluid. So if we encounter something like infrasound, um, which is a, a bass sound that's so low we can't hear it, but our bodies react to the vibration, it actually affects water molecules. So uh, you can get amnesia, you can get walking in your sleep kind of sensations, uh, you can feel like you're being watched, you can get headaches, you can vomit. Um, and even geomagnetic storms from solar flares affect the pineal gland. And uh, it's kind of an interesting thing because I found in my notes, ghost hunting, that uh, my team was not psychic at all. But on nights where there was a geomagnetic storm, everyone declared that it was a very active night because their hair was pulled, they heard or saw something, um, they, had, they were sensing things that they normally don't. And they thought, oh, well, the ghosts were active tonight. They're always, that's always there. It's always there, but they could discern it. They became good receivers. And uh, we also know that when there's a geomagnetic storm, your dreams are very vivid. And, and so I think we just become more acute. And so I got to the point where it was, it was so obvious that if I wanted to get good evidence, I literally pick nights of geomagnetic storms. There, there are apps out there that can tell you that a friend of ours um, in that. Alabama, he ut utilizes an app that tells him when that's going to be. And yeah. he used it. Every investigation I ever knew that he did, he used that to to pinpoint what was going right. on. Yeah, and I tell people if you don't if you if you don't have a psychic on your team, that's one of your best tools. Your second best tool is to give everybody divining rods, copper, copper rods, and let them utilize those because uh, I found that me reading energy in a building and people using the rods, they cross in the exact same spots. So it's another tool that a non-psychic could use that's very helpful. That's what we use the most. I do have one key thing to say, though. We do. If it's lightning outside, don't use them. Yeah, <laughs> right. don't use them in and you don't have to replace all the batteries in them. Yeah, and it's a myth that your sneakers will protect you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Tom has electric ones, so Does he? yeah, I will find out, Charlie, what that app is called. Yeah, I will. used to have it on my phone. Yeah, so I will and, find and out. Those are locations I like to put the recorders into, or even a camera. But I mean, when you get crossover and repeated people are getting crossovers, you just don't tell each other where they crossed until you're all done investigating, you know, going through the rooms. But then later on, you know, everybody say where they found their their crossovers and the ones that more people crossed over in the same spot. You got a good spot. That's what we yeah. do when we're looking for graves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Graves. Hmm. I don't know what you call it when two people fall in the same spot at the same time or at different times. Mm -hmm. Didn't even know it. <laughs> yeah. No, that's how I, that's how I found out. Really. I went through a, a haunted room and I made a little map of the room and I drew X's where the energies were and uh, put that away. And then I sent people in one at a time with the, with the divining rods and a map of the room and they put their X's where it crossed. And when we were done, we laid them out on the bed and we all had exactly, exactly the same places. So, you know what? That's another experiment we should try. Yes. We're yeah. going to do this scientifically. We need to do scientific things. Yeah. I, I, other yeah. than giggle in the room. Right. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a theory that I think, you know, spirits can, uh, they communicate in different frequencies. Uh, mm -hmm. You say dogs, they see spirits. That's pretty obvious. Do you think they hear them? 
I don't know. I'm not even certain. Talk, that I would, you think they talk to the dogs? I would say if they oh, do, yeah. it would be in a mind speak kind of a form because I don't think right. the sound waves would be even necessary or even possible. You know, really, mind speaks the only way you're going to do this. And whatever that highway is, that's consciousness that that carries those messages from one brain to another, and that's the biggest mystery in our universe and something. I'm obsessed with, along with, of course, Tesla's, you know, energy, frequency, vibration. Yeah. Um, these are really, we're getting close to understanding. And once we open that up and we understand how to use consciousness, I think that mankind can literally go to a new level. Right now, we're all very disparate. We're all, you know, we're individuals trying to survive on our own. It's everyone for themselves. And, you know, and then you got all this physical stuff going on and electrical and chemical stuff inside each person. If we could all tap into the same thing, um, you know, we've seen amazing things happen when you get collective consciousness. And when we think that aliens have, can do magic, like, like coming and going in that light, it's just, they're just tapping the same consciousness. And it is one, it is a certain frequency for them. They have to be, this is the frequency for transporting. This is the frequency for sending a message. Uh, they understand how to manipulate that. And we, we have that, we're capable of it. We're just very distracted by the mortal needs, you know, find food, shelter, procreate. Okay, so I'm going to go back to when you were talking earlier, and I'm going to ask some questions. They're, they may seem odd, but I'm odd, and I know it. <laughs> I so, like the odd. <laughs> so do you think that maybe you are a hybrid child? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's quite possible that I am. There, there's, I, I do things so differently than other people. The way I come to conclusions the way I retrieve information. Like if you ask me about my great aunt, she's four feet away and the upper right, and I have to look at that location. All my knowledge is outside my body in a grid. I do things synesthetically. If you say, I'll meet you on Wednesday, Wednesday is right here in space for me. It's not a calendar like people see it. It's a location. So when I talk, you see my eyes going all over the place. That's me, me retrieving information held externally. Um, and that's just one of them, a bunch of weird things about me. Um, and I've always kind of felt I was actually born dead and they had to revive me after several minutes. Um, and then I died again at home and then my mom revived me. Um, but I've always had one foot in, in both places. And, and I was lucky enough to grow in an atmosphere where the psychometry, the mediumship, um, being in two worlds all made sense in that, that historic location that I was in. It was almost as if it was faded that I, my skills get pumped. And when I look back, I do recall my dad treating me differently than the other kids. He encouraged my intelligence. He signed me up for a million different things, anything I had an interest in. I was suddenly signed up for, he was there, he was, you know, attending all these things that I was doing and I was an overachiever and, um, and, and he was just so proud. Uh, now the other kids were very bright in my family, but none of them showed signs of being psychic. Um, so you know, so yeah. now I've got some other thoughts. Okay. Yeah. So one thought is, is that your father's your father, but your mother is not. And she just happened to be the, the carrier. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'd say I, I would say so, except I do look a good deal like my mom. So I, you know, there has to be. But that doesn't mean that your alien mother doesn't look like your mom. I, I there had to be some manipulation in the process of mom. I mean, man, there, I mean yeah, because mom, you, mom shouldn't have gotten pregnant. Like it was physically impossible, and right. the doctors yeah. were baffled. Like how you know we took almost you know we took a lot out of you. There's nothing there to make a baby, but you have a baby in you. And yeah. she managed to carry that baby all the way to time, you know. So there, there's a lot of factors in my dad's secret work with the government. Um, at one point after my father died, I bothered my mom because I found my dad's ID that he carried on him. And I'm like, Mom, what, what, is, what is this? You know, and um, she, all she could say is, well, you know, for years there before you were born, he was doing secret programs for the government and he had to get up and go and do things. And I'm like, OK, what what did he do? And she goes, well, 
he told me that he helped move the bomb around on trains so the USSR couldn't find them. And I'm like, that seems kind of weird. Like, where did dad get that skill? Like what, you know, and, and dad would never speak of it. He just, he, he wouldn't, but dad was a very devoted patriot, 20 years, uh, world war II and Korean war, South Pacific, um, and government. He was who's who in American government. So um, I'll never know really what dad actually was doing at that time. That, but it's that, strange. That, the morning that mom went into labor, they called him to a new job. It is like. <laughs> was he there for you to be born or? No. It, okay. it literally called him while mom was in labor. She was in a taxi going to the hospital. She started pushing me out going over the Potomac. And my dad was uh, at the new job. Luckily, my mom was at the hospital when I was born. There was no, the Potomac was close by, but not that close. Yeah, see, I, I was born in Bethesda because we were military, so yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you probably had special doctors because you were a hybrid and they knew it. Yeah, there was a lot of weird things about my birth that didn't add up and I I never questioned it. Um, Did do any of your other siblings do you have they had tests to find out if they have 25 chromosomes uh no three of my siblings have passed away um and the last one that's left won't do it because he's he's a uh, i guess i call it a fundamentalist baptist cult <laughs> so he he that would be evil to look at your dna that doesn't know and he's a doctor you'd think he'd do it but no he won't well, maybe because of the stuff that he knows, he just doesn't feel it's necessary. Um, have you done your child? Yes, my son had his done, and uh, I'm his mother. <laughs> well, 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 yay! yay. But does he have 25 chromosomes as well? Um, I asked him about that. He hasn't gotten a hold of his raw data. I think I need to go sit down at the computer and see. Uh, Ancestry.com had shown you a lot of things and now they're taking those away and they want you to purchase or something so that you can right. get that. And I was smart. I immediately took my raw data and 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 got that zip file and kept it. Um, and I want to hand that over to some geneticists and see what the heck, you know, what's going on. I'd like to know what that 25th chromosome is for. Uh, maybe it's for smarts. Yeah, it, it could be all these weird things that I that gave you something others don't have. Yeah, that would that would qualify. Because at first I was like, oh my gosh, you know, chimps and gorillas have more DNA. Am I a chimp or a gorilla? <laughs> I was like, I was freaking out at first, and, oh. and but I'm kind of comforted to see that there's some sort of evidence that there's there's something afoot there. Don't don't really. Hey know. Chanel, it's good to see you here. Do you find that you? Uh know things or different subjects that you've never really even studied? I do that often. I'm like, how do I know that? Yeah, um, I'm the same there way. There was a time that. where I, uh, I woke up during the night speaking a foreign language quite fluently. I felt very comfortable speaking it. And I thought, what the heck was that? And so the next night I put a recorder on, um, on auto, um, you know, sound activated. And uh, I did it again. And this time I listened to it and I go, God, I know I'm Scandinavian. It sounded like something Scandinavian. So I went through like a lot of different radio stations in Scandinavia. Like, is this familiar? And I found out it was Sami, which is a Laplander. What did you say? Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. So I was speaking Laplander language and I don't know. Why. Do you know what you said? <laughs> no, no. Couldn't interpret it. I mean, I'm not, I'm good. I'm really good at reading languages. I don't know. Um, but when I hear them, I'm confused. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I can read a lot of different There's languages. Thing. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot of, I have a wide range of psychic skills. I, I never really had played with them before until I left my marriage and realized that, you know, not only do I have psychometry, but like on TV, they put up a sketch of a killer and I suddenly can connect with that killer and I'm in their head and I'm where they live and I understand what they're doing and um, you know, finding missing people, um, predicting things. I, I've been on more airplane disasters and, and, and tsunamis and things than anyone could imagine. So I'm not real keen about flying because I know all the ways a plane can crash. Uh, but I always know I'm an observer. That's the weird thing. No one around me sees or hears me. 
And I'm like, oh, crud, I have to witness another plane crash. So, you know, like TWA 800, I was at the bottom of the ocean, you know, with that. And it happened so quickly. No one had a clue what the heck happened. It just was like, boom, that was it. And um, there was one uh, Hawaiian Air one where the uh, flight attendant got sucked out of the plane. And in that one, it was unusual. I was actually just myself flying beside the plane, watching it happen. Uh, that was different. Usually I'm in the plane when it goes down. Um, just I like the weirdest things. I, I know things I shouldn't know. I, I don't know how I know them, but I, I think we're still talking about tapping into that consciousness. I, I used to worry that it was like something evil or something um, hokey or um, I, I, I couldn't figure out what, what the magic was. And, and the magic is the consciousness. And I could, I could delve into information. Every now and then I'll be out at a, a location, I'll be outdoors and I'll see it as it was a million years ago. And it's as vivid as if it is right there right now. Mm -hmm. And I spontaneous, I have spontaneous astral projection. Um, I've done, I do remote viewing. I, you know, like it doesn't seem to have a limit. So when you talk about all this stuff, I know that it's for you, it's a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now, everything I know, I know we don't like to say everything is science, but Science in a magnificent way is sort of like the notes for a piano piece. If you didn't have that, that the notes there to use the piano, it, it wouldn't work. You wouldn't have a song. It, it, it ties it all together. But we have a whole new level of understanding of our sciences, and that's in the quantum field. And now we're getting really close to being, you know, worthy of what they would say intergalactic communication. So do you believe that you were ever, ever abducted? Um, yes, uh, not, not in the classic sense, not experimentally, but uh, I did have a week where each, each day of that week, I found myself inside of what I would call a spaceship. It was completely formed inside. There were no seams, there were no rivets. It was very... Uh, dome shaped. Uh, I could see a bank of windows that looked out into the distance and it felt like it was very high up. Um, but it was still within Earth's atmosphere. Um, I was taken into a conference room and the people in there looked like you and me and they were wearing suits and it looked like a real business thing. Um, but there was one woman in particular that was leading the whole thing. And I would go in there each day and be questioned up the wazoo about humanity, how they handle things. And I was reassured over and over again that there is, um, I guess, a, a cadre of protectors of Earth and that we are going to come across something that's going to scare us. And how, how can they introduce us to new knowledge without us freaking out? And so we went over this every day and I can't even... I can't even recall all the things that we talked about. But at the end, uh, one of the men in the conference room guided me outside of the room and said, okay, we're done. And uh, don't worry, we've got this. And then I suddenly, I was, I was back in my room, basically. I, there's like a whole gap of time that was missing. That's um, what I was gonna ask. How long right. were you gone? Um, the, first time, the first time it happened, it was probably about an hour. Um, the other days, it was more like two hours. And the very last time, it was like almost four hours that were missed. How long did it feel each time? <clears throat> um, I literally, I mean, other than knowing that we had gone through a ton of questioning, if you had asked me how long it had been, I would probably say 15, 20 minutes. Um, it didn't seem very long, but the clock said it was long. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting because I've been hypnotized in the past. And when I was done with hypnosis, the hypnotist asked me, how long were we, how long were you under? And I said, 15 minutes. And she said, look at the clock, it'd been two hours. So it's a very wow. similar situation. You're very, you're very docile. Not, not like you'll do things you wouldn't normally do, but when people ask you things, you answer. It's like a truth serum. You just answer them honestly. Um, you know, it, it, I, I didn't have anything to hide. I wasn't wondering their motives. I, I, I felt extremely comfortable with them. And I felt extremely comfortable knowing that 
they are intermediaries. Like we won't have a nuclear explosion because they're not going to allow that. And there's things that we, you know, that they're trying to reintroduce or introduce us to, or there's going to be a force from outside that we may be scared of and they want to protect us, but they, they want us to be, we, they treat us like children because they know we're kind of crude and we'll get hysterical. So they're the parents. Yep, and we're probably childish too. So. This is true. I mean, just look at our election. <laughs> oh yeah, let's that, not even go there. Oh, yeah. so, yep. That's on the next year. Susan, Susan Roberts asks, "Have you ever had any encounters with the Men in Black?" No, I haven't. And it's interesting because I've been I've even written a book about my alien encounters. I talk about it on my blog. I talk about it on radio shows. And no one's bothered me. And I find that kind of strange. It is. You want to know why? I'd I say that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I think I think the reason is, is that because you're putting it out there, they just think people are going to discount it as you're crazy. Um, I, I don't think so necessarily. I think they know what, what I am. They're aware of me. I'm on a list. Uh, there's no need to talk to me because they know I exist. It's another way to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do they stop you? I mean, do you have to go through security at the airport? Like anyone else. Okay. <laughs> do they scan you extra hard? Because they seem to scan uh, you more than I think they should. I know my friends always kid me about it, but honestly, I'm always the one they take aside. I don't, I don't know what that is. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I am too. I, don't know. Okay, well, Jeffy, I mean, look, you know. I don't think I'd want to be on the plane you're on, considering you can see <laughs> well, it the crash. Is, here's the thing. If I get on a plane, <laughs> you can be guaranteed I did not have a dream about it crashing oh, okay. before. Yeah. So you want to be on a plane with her. You don't want to be on a yeah. plane without her. I, I had someone. Well, that's right. Yeah. I, at one point, I, I saw a therapist about the dreams because it was concerning how accurate they were. And she kept a log of them. She literally would write down everything I said and then. When this thing happened, she'd put that newspaper clipping on the other page and she'd sit there and she'd highlight all of the similarities. And uh, she got to the point where she said, my family travels a lot. Would you please contact me anytime mm. you have this? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a scary responsibility. I used to feel incredibly guilty. And then I realized I'm looking at this as if it's sequential and, and it's, it's already done. It's not something I can jump in and change. So, Anthony says the list is great. Is that true? Is the list great to be on? Um, or is it just there? I don't know. I, you know, honestly, I'd be happy if the grades would just come back and be a little more specific. I'm really smart, but I may not be getting what this mission is. And um, a lot of things uh, all of a sudden in my life went from being uh, like at the beginning of this year. Everything went from uh, one trial after another to zero trials and everything's golden and everything's happening. So all I have to do right now is just say, I'll keep following this path, it's lit up. It'll take me there. So my time has come, I think. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the next topic. We're gonna see what you gotta say about this. So when I go in the woods, should, be, I, should I be afraid of Bigfoot or should I hold my arms open and say, come here, big boy. Give me a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's going to hug you, but no, um, I'm not scared of that. Not gonna be. I mean, I'm also logical, which people think that means I'm skeptical. It's just look at it realistically. Uh, we go out in the woods constantly. We chop down trees. We kill deer. We go camping and throw beer cans. We ride ATCs through the woods, and that's their freaking home. And they know that this one swap, they could get us, and yet they don't. That's not, they're, they're coming from a very different place and they, they are not, we're, we're, we're reflecting how humans would be territorial or we would be um, in, incensed by this, but this is just a come and go place for them. It's their vacation home, you know, and, and they don't, they don't take it like that and they don't want to hurt us. They really don't want to have to hurt us. It would have to be one of us killing one of theirs to even consider, uh, revenge. So I'm not scared. They certainly don't want to run into us. They 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 know we're there. They're hiding very well. They they know we're coming before we even realize we want to go. 
So um, yeah. yeah, that's what we think. They're just they just come and go. They're not they're not hanging out in the northwest and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not like they sit and write in the of years. sand. This is my property. Get out of it. Right. Um, so and do you just don't come from where we do. Do you believe that Bigfoot or Sasquatch is of this planet or maybe of another planet? Um, I'm going to go so far as to say that to me, it seems almost, and, and this is just a, a hypothesis I've come to, the alien greys were the first civilization here. And they advance themselves to the ability to understand tapping into that consciousness and going elsewhere. And I believe that this, the, the next was probably the reptoids. And then after that, the Bigfoot. And Bigfoot did get to that. They got to that level. And I think if you look at any of the mound cultures and the Cahokia and all the things that were obtained, the megalithic structures, uh, they obviously got a, a, an understanding of the natural sciences that we're so hooked on, on technology that we bypass the natural sciences and the education that it could have given us. And I think that they can come and go just like the greys do. And I, I think they, they watch us too, because they realize at some point we're going to get to that point too. And do they want us there or not? You know, I, it's a cautious thing. Are we ready? Are we ready to be able to toggle? So are we one universe with multi-layers or are we multiple universes with multi-layers <laughs> that's interesting co concept I, I can tell you that the alien greys i've absolutely zeroed out they did not fly here from some distant planet um they literally are, are able to parallel us so there's a lot of worlds beside us a lot of dimensions um it could explain too why they wear this suit that they wear when they come here. Because if you think about it, if you want to become two dimensional, you have to take a photograph of yourself. Now that, that makes you go down a dimension, right? If they want to go down to our dimension, they're going to have to have, you know, the, the front side, back, top, bottom. Um, and that would help them to do that because I don't think that what we're seeing is at all representative of what they are, but I do think that they're probably a higher dimension. Another thought that I just had hmm. was not not that we are are I mean, are we just dimension on top of dimension on top of dimension, and we're just getting dementia from it all, <laughs> you know? Or are we in a recycle mode where everything is? You know, we're like on a on a time basis and it all just kind of replays over time, over and over again, over time. And it well, just kind of like the others, you know, in the movie, the others, be a Bigfoot next play. you know, the girl, the kids are sitting there and from the 1800s and here comes in a real estate agent from the 2000s, you know, showing the house and they kind of collide. Is that kind of where we are, that we collide? Is that why we see this stuff? Well, I, I think I'd start with humanity itself. Uh, there's a theme throughout life that history repeats itself. We're limited with what we can do and what we can obtain. We can go to war, we can birth, we can die, um, we can make speeches, we can create governments, but we're not really expanding. We're, we're creating technologies, but those aren't expanding humanity at all. Uh, yeah, just, it's you know, narrowing us. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there comes a, a point where we become redundant. And I think it's at that point of redundancy that either we move on, we develop the next level. Like I said, if it's true that Bigfoot are able to toggle themselves, we need to get to the place where we toggle ourselves or else we're just basically going to be a wiped out disaster that has to be recreated from scratch. So we're, we're in a time of great test for, for humanity. And I think that it would help us a lot if quantum science could help us understand it. So it's not scary and it's not weird and portals are a thing. They're not, you know, like woo woo magic and they're not some way that evil things come in and out. Um, it's, it's, if you took a caveman and, and thawed him out from the ice and had to bring him into this world, it'd be a little daunting for him. And that's what we're gonna be facing. We're, we're cavemen being thought out into a potential. 
Will we live that potential or will we uh, go back to the ice? Yeah, I can see that, you know, if we've got a portal, you know, we're taking the long way to Mars. I'm not going know. back to ice. No, we're not going back to ice. <laughs> Thank so, you. so, you know, you've got all the, you know, they're, they're taking the long way to, to Mars by taking a rocket ship and going there. Takes them however many years to get there. If the, there is a better way to get there through a portal where mm -hmm. it's instantaneous, that could give a huge advantage. But if our minds are closed and we're not and we're not growing, we're not going to get there. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like like the example of the dimensions. I mean, you got a two dimensional photo photograph of yourself. Now, if it, if it could want to live its potential, it would love to be the three dimensional person it's representing. And I think what we miss as mortals is we take this as the only thing. And, and yeah, mankind itself can progress. I'm certainly living in a different time than my Viking ancestors did. Um, but I still have the same traits, the same goals and desires. Um, but I think what we're missing here is the next, the higher dimension. And that's, we all have to die. We all have to move on. We, we have to join something that has no physicality. We become an energy. We join that collective um, consciousness and, and the power of that. Think about the extreme love that people feel when they have an NDE. It permeates from the plants and the roadways and the trees and everything else. And uh, everything we have here is basically a three-dimensional uh, demonstration of what's, what, what is in the reality. We're not in the reality right now. We're just on a stage. The reality happens when we pass. And I think if we all came from knowing that and understanding that, we would do things here so differently. We'd say, let's advance humanity. Let's let people actually be able to tap into that collective consciousness, that love, that, that complete and utter unconditional acceptance. I mean, it sounds really, you know, new age and like I'm toking or something, but, um, but that really is all there is. That's, if you get down to the most pure energy, it's interpreted as love. And if we could do that, if we could do that while we're human, we could make miracles happen like those aliens do, come and go in lights and do all that stuff. So yeah, it, it is, it, it's a big time for humanity right now. This is a real big turning point. Well, I'd like to thank you so much for all your words of wisdom mm -hmm. and sharing with mm -hmm. us all this information. Where mm -hmm. can everybody find you, Sharon? Uh, ghosthuntingtheories.com. And you can find her here every once in a while, too, apparently, guys. So make sure you check yeah, us right. out and see what we're talking about. Um, uh, join me next Monday night for my guest, Brett Yakabochi. There you go. Say that fast many times and see if you can get it right. He's going to be talking to us on the Paranormal Pride at 7 p.m. next Monday. So, mm -hmm. And we will not be having this show next week at 5 o'clock. Nope. It will be an election special. So make sure you tune in for the election special on all the pages except for mine. It won't be on mine. <laughs> um, so keep that in mind. So what's your prediction? Yeah. Do you have a prediction for the election? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so do you think it's going to go left or right? <laughs> well, I, I think that it's, it's definitely going to go right. But the thing is, um, there's still going to be an awful, it's, it's not going to be that easy. There's not going to be clean we're cut. Already, we're already seeing a lot of interference. Right. I like, I like to say, you know, I dropped off my ballot. Luckily, my drop box wasn't burned, but that's right. only an obstacle course. And that obstacle course is going to have thieves and scandals and disasters. And it, so if it gets to its point where it gets counted, uh, you know, God bless. It was a miracle. Yeah, so we went in. Messy. After, afterwards, there'll be a huge mess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we did it in person today. Yay! So I'm going to tell everybody the same thing I said last night. Vote early, vote often. Just make sure it counts. And uh, I think it's good. Track your vote. Track it. You can track it online. Make sure that it went the way that you put it in. I think Trump's going to kick her ass. So, and, and if it's going to be 
<laughs> two blue states that were blue. They're going to go red this time. So. Yeah. And Hi, everybody. I'm, I am, as you can tell, all for logic. <laughs> so yeah. logic and, is win, not fairy dust. <laughs> yeah. So everybody, if you don't vote, don't bitch. So join us here. Every, you know, just, just find us. Just Monday find night, us. 7 p.m. Central, the Paranormal Pride. Check out all the shows on the Bill of Rights Network. And if you're into the election stuff, Make sure you check out the shows you know, here on the Bill of start Rights at Network. What, five o'clock next week, Carl. Yeah, we'll start live next week at five p.m. Central Time on the Bill of Rights Network and on Born TV and on the Conservative View page. So, and this will pages. not be. It will it be? It won't be on things and. Right, it won't be on. I won't put it on things, and I won't put it on the Temple of Phoenix Rising Entertainment Facebook page or YouTube or any of those. So you guys check out those if you want to be part of that. Um, but you guys, thank you so much for coming and listening and spending your evening with us. We appreciate it, especially during this Halloween season where everybody has so much more to do. So, right. But see you guys next Monday. Have a great night. Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you next good night. Well, we'll see you in two weeks here. So have a good evening. <laughs>